As I was preparing for this, I learnt the following about Russian defence spending. It is 10% of GDP if you include the intelligence services. Ours is a bit over two. It's 30% of the budget and it's just gone up by 50% from last year's defence budget. And Putin has got the defence industries working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and paying accordingly. Putin last week in front of a gathering of defence industries said he'd instructed the Russian Ministry of Defence to pay the companies who are making weapons 80% in advance of the manufacture. Now there's one to you know, sort out speed of uh, decision making, I would have thought. So as Russia enters its third year of this war against Ukraine, we need to ask how will it end? How do you defeat a country with 1,500 strategic nuclear warheads and another 4,500 in various states of uh, storage and reserve? The situation today is grave, but it is far from hopeless. Russian forces have gained the initiative across the theatre and are making gains. Also over the weekend, from my social media sources, Russia is setting conditions to conduct hybrid warfare operations in the Baltic states and Finland. It doesn't say they're going to war, it's saying they're stating the conditions of. In the independent country of Moldova, which is between Ukraine and Romania, there's a breakaway province which has occurred since 1991 and the disintegration of the Soviet Union called Transnistria. And there is word that that is Putin's next objective, to make that a separate state of Russia. What are Putin's excuses and explanations for going to this war, because it's important both as an academic and in my previous profession of intelligence officers, you need to be able to get inside this person's mind. You don't agree with the person, and I certainly don't, I think he's a nasty piece of work. His reasons are as follows. First, the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 was the most serious geopolitical catastrophe in modern history, he says. And we need to remember that the Soviet Union in the first year of um, Russia, the GDP in one year fell by 40%. Inflation was 1,900%. People's savings meant nothing. Russia lost half its population of 280 million, 180, 140 million separated, and it lost 70% of its territory, which is most of Australia as a comparison, it's certainly a bigger chunk than Western Australia. He does not accept that there is a separate country called Ukraine, even though the then government under Yeltsin, in the famous meeting in the Belarusian woods, the leaders of Russia, Belarus, met and they decided that there would be separate countries. One of Yeltsin's advisors hauled him back and said, you haven't discussed with Ukraine the situation in Crimea. He said that will be handled later in international legal discussions. Well, it hasn't been handled with international legal conditions. Second and associatedly, Putin believes there is no such country as Ukraine, even though his country, under Yeltsin, agreed there was an independent country with independent boundaries. In a piece he wrote a year and a half ago, he says, we are one country, one people, one language, one Russian Orthodox faith. Well, demonstrably, if that was ever true, which I don't think it was, it's now certainly not the case in Ukraine. You can imagine what people's attitudes are. But it tells you about, with both the catastrophic disintegration of the former Soviet Union as a great power, the humiliation of Russia and his view that he wants to rebuild it. Solzhenitsyn, not some left-wing communist, before he died and the Russian, Soviet Union had disintegrated, called for a, a new country called, which combined Russia, great Russians, Ukraine, little Russians, and Belarus, white Russians. He called for that before he died. As for the rest, he said, who's interested in Kazakhstan, the Central Asian republics, or the Caucasian ones? They're not Russian. There's complexities in this. Third, Putin's view that NATO's expansion to the borders of the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, is an act of military aggression. Many of you may have different views. I had 
the Russian ambassador here in Canberra, Moiseev, say to me in 91, as the economy was collapsing and inflation was rampant, Paul, you in the West need to have a Marshall Plan of economic aid because we are in a bad shape and it's going to get worse. And if you're not careful, if you don't help us financially, you may end up with a Weimar Republic. Well, where are we now? Teetering on the edge of it, in my view. And there were people in the American administration, the George Bush senior administration, he was a, a serious president, unlike some others we can think of. And his Secretary of Treasury said to George Bush, in answer to a question, can you get a Marshall Plan t together? The Secretary of the Treasury, I've forgotten his name, said to the President, no, Mr. President, I think we shouldn't be helping them at all. We should put them in the direction of being a third-rate country, economically, and with all that, that means militarily. So there are the main reasons he articulates the cat catastrophic collapse of the Soviet Union, no such country as Ukraine, NATO's expansion to the very borders, and Ukraine's ambition to a being a member of NATO is seen by Putin as a first order strategic challenge. A spear aimed at the heart of Russia is the sort of language he uses. In addition to those four main excuses, explanations, he has of late introduced a fifth one. You remember at the very beginning he talked about the na Nazification of Ukraine, whatever that meant. It had some truth in the Second World War, but certainly not since then. But now the new theme is, which is going down much better with the Russian population, and 62% of a reasonably reliable opinion poll are saying that 62% of Russians uh, believe there is a new strategic threat to Russia, Holy Mother Russia, from the West. The West is seeking to destroy Russia, and Russia is now fighting for its, quote, very survival, unquote. 62%. You'll notice there have been two phases of this war. At the very beginning, 24th of February 2022, most of the pundits, and I was getting advice from colleagues, former colleagues, that there was 175,000 Russian troops on the very border. And then once I was told very discreetly that we detected the movement of blood banks and hospitals, up to the border, that was good enough for me. And I went public and said, he's about to do it. 